Okay, um, I think we can start. Um, we have quite a, um, a number of participants, but it seems that we, we are um, more or less stable now. And um, yeah, uh, I want to welcome you to, to this launch conference, uh, launch event for the Mirren project. I will say uh, a few words about the project uh, in a minute. Uh, my name is Albert Kralla. Uh, I'm assistant professor at Stanley University Krems, uh, and I'm the coordinator of the Mirren project. Um, in this afternoon, um, we will discuss two aspects that are also dealt with in the projects, namely um, how many um, undocumented migrants there are and why one would need uh, a quantitative data uh, on irregular migrants. And second, um, we will discuss um, um, one pathway out of irregularity uh, regularization. And um, we will uh, have two panels. Um, one will be focus on, on data and estimates and the second on, on, on regularization. And I first will give you a, a little bit of an insight into the um, Miriam project. And I will um, share my slides in uh, just a minute. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Um, I cannot find it at, um, yet. Uh, so. Okay, here we are. Um, so what, what are we doing in this project? The project is first of all, an, 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 a project that is funded under, under the Horizon Europe uh, program of the European <laughs> Union. And it's a um, project that will um, well, um, take place for uh, three years and will focus on, on two aspects that I already mentioned um, and before. On first, on, on, on the quantitative aspect of, of uh, irregular migration and, and second, on uh, regularization. And I just uh, show you here the, the, the link uh, we just set up, launched um, a temporary uh, provisional website today. So you can have a look at, uh, at the website and, and uh, also find more um, information on the project. Um, but what is one of the starting points of the project um, is that quantifications, quantitative representations of um, irregular migration are a quite a central issue in policy debates. Um, most recently, there have been debates about uh, Austria's uh, rejection of, um, of uh, Romania's Schengen, uh, um, well, um, putting into force of a Schengen uh, uh, agreement, which was um, partly argued um, on the basis of numbers, uh, namely on the, um, the, the number of persons that uh, Austria found not to have registered, not to have been uh, identified, apprehended by, uh, by border guards. And uh, so the claim of the Austrian government was uh, have uh, irregularly and, um, and uh, in, an, in an undocumented, unrecorded fashion um, transited um, the Western Balkan route uh, through, amongst others, uh, Romania and, and, and Bulgaria. Um, and you see a number of, of many other um, figures here in, uh, presented um, that we are often served on a daily basis. Um, asylum figures uh, are mentioned uh, every, every now and then. Um, um, uh, you hear um, almost weekly reports on the number of migrants who have died uh, en route to a European country or uh, in other parts of the world. So this, this, this quantifications are a very important part, uh, and they are also an important element of the debate in terms of, um, yeah, um, of of addressing irregular migration in in in, in policies, um, whether it's through regularization, where numbers are often also uh, um, made well um, made in. in referred to as a reference um, as uh, something that you would not want because it involves so many people um, 
or um, their um, um, and, um, yeah, uh, and where it's uh, on the other hand also not clear how many people would be uh, benefiting from a from a regularization. Um, and uh, in in broad terms, one can um, summarize the policy um, debate on irregular um, migration in Europe um, today in 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 two ways. First, there's an, an issue about what the actual problem is, and here we see. Um, um, yeah, um, actually, um, a framing of uh, irregular migration that transgresses the, um, the, the boundaries and um, and uh, uh, for example, the, the debates on international protection, um, asylum um, is always is, is very mixed up with, with uh, issues around irregular migration. Um, it's um, what is exactly understood as 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 irregular, um, unwanted, uh, uncontrolled, uh, is a question, uh, and a related issue uh, um, is of course what the scale of a problem is, um, and the scale of what the scale of a problem is is depends on the way how you frame it and how you define it. So there's a there, there's an interrelationship there. Secondly. Um, there is, of course, the issue, what can be done about the problem? Again, there are different answers depending on what um, the, the, the problem is that um, is identified uh, and to start with. Um, and we know a number of the, 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 the answers to uh, the issue. Um, border control, more border control, uh, more return, uh, more cooperation with the third countries through remote control, um, there's less talk about regularization um, and less talk about migration reform. Now, um, in Miriam, we basically address um, both uh, dimensions of the problem. So what, what, we, what actually the problem is, we want to understand better uh, how we can understand and measure different aspects of migrant uh, regularity. Um, but we also want to understand how we can um, find uh, responses to it. Um, and in that way, we want to contribute with that project um, to a shared understanding of both the problem uh, and possible solutions, and also bring a little bit of clarity uh, in the debate. Um, yeah, I, I want to stop here um, in and um, yeah, wish you all an, an interesting and enjoyable um, um, afternoon and um, hand over to, um, uh, to Daniel Hoden, who will host um, the first panel um, of this opening conference. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Albert. Um, Good afternoon um, to everybody who's joining from a European time zone. Um, I'm Daniel Howden. I am the director of Lighthouse Reports, which is um, a European investigative journalism um, outfit. We work with uh, some of Europe's leading me um, media um, to, to do deeply reported public interest investigations. Um, my own entry point into this topic um, came about four years ago now, um, when I set off as an individual journalist to try and um, answer what to me seemed like important questions. Um, considering that uh, migration um, was and is um, probably the dominant political issue um, across the European space, um, it seemed to me um, that in addition to focusing our attention on uh, numbers of uh, people crossing borders and, and um, entries of, of people, uh, refugees, migrants, and others um, into Europe's borders, it would make sense to understand more about the population of um, irregular migrants uh, in, in the European Union. So initially it was something of a shock to me um, to find how difficult a question that was to answer. It seemed like a fairly simple journalistic question. Um, if we're going to say that the flow is important, um, surely then also the stock uh, is an issue. 
Um, so I was going to write a, a series of three pieces, um, which we're going to look at this in more detail. Um, and it was a bit of a learning process for me. And I'm pleased to say that today, many of the, the smartest people who helped me to reach a level of understanding about this um, are part of today's event. Um, so I'm not going to take up too much time here. Just to say that what I discovered um, in stages was um, was that the last really serious effort um, to achieve a meaningful estimate of Europe's um, population of irregular migrants uh, dates back to 2009. Um, the data that made up that project was just clandestino, many of whose authors um, are part of today's event. Um, that data came from a period between 2001 and 2007. Um, now, there are a lot of reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into um, with the participants today, why Europe decided to stop meaningfully counting at a European level um, its um, population, of, um, its irregular population. Um, but it's obviously good news um, if, uh, if Miram is going to mean that that process meaningfully restarts. One of the most powerful things, so part of being a journalist is needing to talk to editors and persuade them what you think is interesting is in the public interest and is interesting also to them. So one of the questions that came back to me is why does it matter if we don't know what the irregular um, migrant population of Europe is? And the single strongest cut, cut through answer to that question at the time was that it can, and it was provided um, by a number of people who you'll hear from, but particularly from Jan Bratt, who's gonna be one of our first, um, first participants um, in this panel. One of the strongest answers was that it's a public health question. Um, if we're going to plan meaningful um, uh, public health policies, then we need to know uh, we need to know the disposition of our of, of the population in order to be able to um, understand what uh, what public health threats there are and how we can best um, manage public health. So my personal journey into understanding this population came um, in 2019. Obviously, within two years, we found ourselves um, in a global pandemic and in a graphic illustration of the kinds of public health questions that can arise and why having no answers to these questions um, becomes intensely problematic. Um, we set out as Lighthouse to try and understand what was happening um, to uh, with the undocumented population during the pandemic, um, were they getting vaccinated, were they not, um, and all of the interlocking data, um, missing absent data questions really, really came to the fore during that period of time. Um, now, some of the answers to these questions are, are political. Um, we spent some time trying to understand what the impact of um, what can be broadly categorized as um, hostile environment um, policies towards uh, irregular um, undocumented populations, what the impact of those were, um, and what we were able to see um, from existing research and from experts and from our own reporting in undocumented communities was that frequently the, uh, the hostile pol policies, while they played well at a national level, um, at a municipal and um, uh, local level, uh, frequently led to increases in the migrants because they drove people into irregular situations, increased the number of undocumented people. Um, so it can we we were able to discern um, even as journalists looking into this that there were um, there were reasons why tough stances, hostile policies um, towards undocumented migrants might play well um, at a national level, but they leave cities and um, vulnerable populations facing real problems. Um, so I'm really glad to be talking today um, at the beginning of a process, which I hope will provide more data, um, illuminate some of the issues um, that are present here, um, make some space to talk about solutions as well. Um, um, none of these are simple questions. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to hearing the answers that are gonna come from the panelists. I'm gonna give each of our panelists um, time to make some short opening comments. Um, and I hope to return, um, we're gonna be a bit tight for time. We're running a little bit late. Um, so I'll ask them to keep their initial intervention to eight minutes each. 
um, and we will try to leave some time after those initial comments for some questions um, from, from the attendees today. So with all of that said, I'll come to my um, first uh, panelist. Uh, Jan and I met um, going back about three years or so ago in um, his city of Utrecht, um, where he has a deep experience um, of how a progressive city can try to deal with um, its undocumented population in a, in a meaningful and helpful way. Um, I look forward to hearing from, from Jan. It's been a while since we've um, spoken on this issue. Um, so I'll hand you over to Jan, who's held a number of different roles, but is currently the Senior Policy Advisor on Migration in the City of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and also Chair of the City Initiative on Undocumented Migrants. Um, handing over to you, Jan. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, to be specific, I'm the Chair of the City Initiative uh, on Migrants with Irregular Status in Europe. That's a network of uh, about 40, 50 cities in Europe who are all dealing with uh, irregular or undocumented uh, migrants. And then we work together with Oxford University. So just uh, to be uh, fair to this. Um, yeah, I was asked uh, to, to, to say the, something about the importance of uh, data for, uh, for the uh, local level. And um, of course, uh, everyone uh, can, uh, knows and can see that the local level is very important because the undocumented migrants or irregular migrants are in our cities, in our municipalities. Um, uh, and uh, we, they are there, they have health problems, they have all kinds of uh, specific uh, uh, problems. And uh, we just have to think about all kinds of services we should be uh, uh, give because of public order, because of public health, or because of uh, uh, <clears throat> human rights uh, uh, treaties uh, says we should do. Uh, but we also think uh, it's smart to do. Uh, and um, and um, of course, for example, in Utrecht, we have uh, uh, around 235 uh, places for undocumented migrants where they get guidance, legal guidance or return guidance and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, services to find uh, what we call a durable solution and that can be or returned to the home country or a residence permit. And that's part of, of a national scheme uh, already for four years with five cities and probably eight. Uh, and, um, and we work together with the national government uh, uh, about that and we get also money for it. So it's, uh, but the question is also, and also because the scheme will be uh, a national uh, uh, comprehensive program, one of the questions is how many shelter places or how many people uh, will be part of that program? And the question before that is how many undocumented migrants are there in the Netherlands or are there in Utrecht or Amsterdam or Rotterdam? Uh, and that's always a, a very difficult uh, uh, answer to give because there are all kinds of uh, scientific research on that and uh, and uh, for example uh, in, in the scientific researches in the past shows that in Utrecht it's somewhere between 3,000 and 20,000 uh, and if you see the, 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 the calculations on national level it's somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 uh, in the Netherlands uh, so it's quite important that we know more about it and also on the European level because everyone is thinking oh are those undocumented migrants coming to us in our city or in our, our country and uh, um, and because the clandestino uh, research is uh, a long time ago it is uh, for us it's very important to have the, the good conversations on the local level, on the national level, and on the European level, to have some some new estimates, some new ideas about it, because much change in uh, in many years, and uh, and um, and of course an estimate is one thing, uh, but uh, maybe more important is uh, the the question 
uh, who are those people? Who, uh, what, what is the situation of them? And what are the possibilities to find a solution? Uh, but for example, if we have, we have we are, on the moment, BS cities are in negotiation with the national government, we have to decide how many places uh, is feasible for uh, uh, that uh, national scheme. Uh, and uh, and therefore this this research can help maybe not as early as next year but maybe in a few years uh, uh, ahead of us uh, to give some more better estimates and then we can better plan about it and also it takes away the political unrest it was already mentioned uh, before on the, those people are all coming and it are millions or something like that and uh um, and that that helps us a lot to make it a more uh, uh discuss, a political discussion and a more uh, discussion on um on the facts and not on a feeling and uh, or estimates who have a big variation. So I think uh, that helps uh, a lot and it helps us also a lot in um, thinking about do we need to have more services from the moment, for example, it's cold weather, we give all the homeless, EU migrants, undocumented Dutch uh, 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 homeless, we give them shelter. But how many people are that, and, and will there be more? So we can have better uh, estimates, and we can better make our policies work, and, and give better advice to our politicians. So for us, and that's not only Utrecht, but in the whole uh, uh, network of CMIs with cities across Europe, uh, it can help us uh, to uh, make uh, a better overview and to. Uh, uh show some new facts on uh on, on this matter and that can help us to uh, also lobby with the specific national government of or with the european union so that's very short my first comment <clears throat> thanks very much to jan um and i'm turning next to um <clears throat> dieter vogel um Dieter is uh, one of the most clear thinking and clear communicating people um, uh, that I've come across in talking about in talking to um, about numbers and specifically the the persistence of um, of wrong numbers. Um, so I look forward to hearing from her today. Dieter is a senior researcher at the University of, of Bremen. Um, I'll come come to you next, Dieter. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, I was coordinating the compilation of the database on irregular migration and the clandestine project, um, which directly involved information on stocks and flow of 12 countries with more than 80% of the EU population. And with that data, we made an estimate for the European Union. So thank you for inviting me to look back on Clandestino and what we can maybe learn from this data compilation uh, effort for the future project for Miriam. Uh, let me start with some comments on estimates of the total number of irregular migrants in the European Union, although this is not the purpose of the current project. So Clandestino confirmed that the usual level of reliability cannot be reached in EU estimates, mainly because conditions for data collection are so different in the member states. However, we could show that some frequently quoted estimates at that time were based on rules of thumb, like 1% of the population or 10 to 20% of the foreign population, which had no justification at all and were clearly misleading. So our new estimates replaced these old ones for a while. Our estimate was none that could support the claim for detailed policies. 
but it made it more difficult to forward clearly unfounded and often exaggerated numbers to frame policy debate. It should be kept in mind that the role of data and estimates in public debates is not only about evidence for policy making, but also about framing a debate about the need for specific policies. This is a reason why we should not put up with really bad and misleading numbers, even if we cannot provide really good and reliable numbers. Uh, besides the new EU estimate, the clandestino project developed a good understanding of the available data and estimation techniques, and this laid the basis for discrediting clearly misleading estimates as for example, the estimate of the Pew Research Center from 2019. In this, Connor and Parcel had used fine-tuned statistical techniques to estimate the EU population with inadequate definitions from inadequate databases so that it was possible to show that it had no value at all, as for example, was done in the criticism on the estimate for Germany by the Dietzim Institute. In my view, discrediting clearly misleading claims about numbers of irregular migrants is still one of the most important functions of research in this field. And as new databases have been developed since clandestino is over, it should be transparently documented what can be done with them and what not. In my view, this is something for Mirim Project to accomplish. Beyond that, there are two aspects uh, in which a project like Mirren could deliver current knowledge that could encourage reasonable public debates in the field. First, if policies for regularization or better implementation of human rights are debated, it is important to estimate the number of persons who might profit from such, such changes, as Jan has just. Uh, uh, said. <clears throat> so definitions for such estimates may deviate from comparative definitions of irregular and tolerated populations. Miram could deliver good knowledge of available data sources for upcoming debates on such issues. It's very good that it also looks at the city level where questions may be different, where it might be much more useful to uh, make an estimate of the homeless population, including undocumented immigrants, if this is a question which is uh, relevant for the policy debate. For example, in Germany, we did something like that as well with regard to children in need of schooling, which is a specific subpopulation as well. So this is sort of a first other thing beyond large estimates for policy framing, which can be done in the project. And second, I would find it very useful to formulate simple rules as advice for publishing data, data related to irregular migration. Miriam could do more than clandestino with that regard. In clandestino, for example, we pointed out that estimates should be ranges instead of figures and that the degree of reliability should be indicated. So let me finally finalize my comments with some indications in which directions the search for something like that could go on. For example, if Frontex publishes data on apprehensions at the border, they usually only indicate irregular entries but they also have figures of exits of persons without proper documentation. A simple rule could be something like that. If your data includes inflows and outflows, always pu publish both at the same time. A second example with regard to organizations supporting irregular migrants. In this context, upper estimates are often quoted to attract public attention. However, estimates of a lower range, for example, using client numbers, could show how easy it would be to help and thus to encourage politicians to take action. 
a rule could be raise attention rather with increases in client numbers than with upper level estimates. A last example um, that was also on the first slide that Albert has shown um, a couple of minutes ago, Eurostat data on third country nationals found to be illegally present and third country nationals order to leave give the impression that exact comparable numbers exist, but they are not really comparable. So a clearly formulated warning concerning specific data sources directed to public users would also be handy. So let me stop with these couple of indications uh, derived from looking back at the clandestino project and looking forward to the future of Miram. Thank you so much, Dieter. Um... It's good to, to look back and, and forward. I'm going to ask part of, um, attendees um, if they have any questions, if you could submit those um, through the chat. Uh, we're going to try to make some time to address some questions um, after hearing from um, our next panelist, um, who's the last of the panelists for this session. There's a second panel that follows at four o'clock, um, CET. Um, in this round, we're going to come um, finally to Tamás Molna. Um, Tamás is uh, part of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, where uh, he is a project officer for um, Justice Digital and Migration Unit. Um, and it'd be good to, uh, to get Tamás's perspective um, on some of the issues that we've already had uh, introduced to us and um, any hopes that he might have for the direction that um, that Miram and uh, future research may take. Over to you, Tamás. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone. First off, I would like to thank the organizers for having, a, having invited the Fundamental Rights Agency. It's my great honor and pleasure to speak at this uh, event, uh, launching this uh, highly uh, uh, timely and, and interesting and filling uh, research. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, talk about uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency's work related to the uh, rights of uh, migrants in irregular situation, what we have done, what we have mapped and found in this regard in, in the past uh, uh, decade. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, uh, which is uh, just uh, one uh, slide, uh, to accompany my oral uh, intervention. So you can see this is the title uh, as I just outlined. Um, and and uh, the following just portrays the skeleton of what I'm gonna talk about. So just to start with some contextualization, uh, the fundamental rights agencies uh, work, the essence of it is to provide evidence-based and data-driven social legal advice to EU institutions and uh, member states alike. We are uh, uh, conducting the so-called social legal research based on data collected through our uh, research network. Uh, this is FRANET, that's this acronym we use, but also uh, occasionally FRA stuff, uh, FRA stuff uh, uh, going on site and, and collecting data on the ground. And then we analyze the, the findings, always anchored in law, uh, in view of uh, presenting comparable uh, data across the, the EU. So uh, for us, uh, research innovative nature can be captured in the, in the novelty uh, of introducing the sociological and statistical method when assessing the fundamental rights situation across the EU um, and not exclusively pursuing the traditionally predominant legalistic approach based on desk research, which is mostly common in this human rights landscape, in this institutional uh, landscape uh, uh, on the European continent. So um, I would like to focus on select uh, reports and research materials that the agency produced uh, on that matter of protecting the rights of, of uh, uh, irregular migrants. The first one is more than or yeah, uh, some 11 years old, uh, uh, this general report on mapping uh, the situation of uh, irregular uh, migrants in the EU across the EU 27. 
but its findings uh, uh, are still relevant and and uh, unfortunately many of them have not lost its uh, uh, topicality so this report uh, is based on a comparative research on the fundamental rights situation of irregular migrants in eu 27 and it advises how fundamental rights should be incorporated in policies laws and administrative practices uh, of member states which affect uh, this population doing a horizontal across the board approach uh, looking at areas of access to labor market housing healthcare education and family life this is the first report which uh, covers a range of rights for all eu member states uh, at that time and speaking of its methodology it rests on two pillars first this is desk research of existing secondary sources uh, accompanied by second uh, uh, a set of uh, structured questionnaires uh, namely three sets of structured questionnaires to collect comparable information across all EU member states. And these have been addressed to central authorities, local authorities, uh, uh, coupled with empirical fieldwork based research on two specific themes, domestic work and healthcare. And this uh, uh, third leg was conducted in 10 EU member states with more than 100 and more than 200 interviews, respectively. Uh, yeah, this, this data collection uh, was conducted back in uh, 2010, so right after the clandestino figures came out uh, uh, by a consortium led by ICMPD, uh, the International Center for Migration Policy Development. The members were SAPS, uh, the Hellenic Foundation for European Foreign Policy, and NPCUM, our uh, organizers today. Uh, without going into the details, just one uh, uh, reflection on, on the two broad categories of irregular migrants this report identified. Uh, I guess now it's, it's, it goes without saying, but it, it's, I think it is worth recalling that first we have those living in hiding whose stay is not known to the authorities and for that we use clandestine data. And on the other hand, we have a group uh, uh, with people whose presence in the territory is known to the authorities, but who for for a variety of reasons, um, cannot be removed, uh, be it for legal or humanitarian considerations or practical obstacles or policy choices. And uh, as a result of this uh, uh, horizontal across the board report, uh, some follow up thematic reports uh, were also produced as spin offs. Uh, one of them is a report looking into irregular migrants employed in domestic work. So the focus was on domestic uh, work, uh, again, based on research conducted with predominantly female migrants and civil society organizations in 10 select uh, member states. And this report highlights some of the fundamental right challenges affecting uh, this group employed in domestic uh, uh, work sector, focusing on their experiences uh, uh, their personal experiences, finding of course finding that the the risk of violations, rights violations, uh, are exacerbated uh, uh, for workers who do not have the right to stay in the host country because of the special vulnerability. Then the third uh, uh, report, like the second spin-off, uh, looks into the access to healthcare again in ten uh, uh, member states. Uh, where we found that the risk of detection uh, and deportation prevents uh, irregular migrants from seeking health care, even in those countries where it is legally available. And, and we suggested then uh, disconnecting health care, access to health care services and immigration control uh, policies. The last example uh, is, is, a, is a short paper from 2017 uh, looking into irregular migrants uh, who cannot be removed. So the, the situation for non-removables, which of course draws on past raw materials, draws on the reports I've just outlined, and it draws attention to the obligation of EU member states to provide these non-removables with a certificate of postponement of removal and to grant them uh, access to core fundamental rights as required by the return directive, uh, first and foremost, uh, at the EU uh, uh, legal uh, framework level. Then very briefly, and I will finish off with that, the policy impact of, of, of these research uh, outputs and findings, both at EU member state level. First, I would start with uh, uh, underlying that the reports have to put this topic on the EU agenda uh, because of its novel, their novelty and, and, and uh, first time uh, uh, nature of, of looking into those phenomena. 
Then FRA produced uh, a guidance on apprehensions of irregular migrants and fundamental rights uh, considerations, which emerged from these reports. And this uh, guidance uh, was later on endorsed by the European Commission, has been put in, into the return uh, handbook, which is a, an EU policy document guiding uh, return enforcing authorities and member states how to implement the return directive. And uh, the, the considerations in this apprehension guidance uh, are regularly assessed during Schengen evaluation on site visit, Schengen evaluation uh, um, processes. Then also the, the findings on the right to health care triggered some discussions uh, in the Commission uh, uh, throughout uh, the years 2010. Uh, and similarly, uh, one can see some progress on, on certifying uh, non removable, so providing the certificate for for this uh, group. First, this is highlighted uh, in the return handbook. And uh, this issue is uh, from uh, quite some time has been regularly checked during the Schengen evaluation on site missions as well when, when these uh, missions go to uh, uh, member states uh, looking into the application, the actual application of the Schengen Aki. And, and that aspect was quite hidden. Now it's part and parcel of the evaluation uh, process. And the last example relates to the report on irregular migrants uh, uh, as domestic workers. Since now labor exploitation is, is gaining momentum at the, at the EU level, see for, in, for instance the European platform uh, tackling undeclared work, which has a recently established subgroup uh, dealing with uh, migrant workers and, and FRA is also part of that. So we could feed uh, our findings from these even a bit dated reports, but again, the, their topicality uh, has not faded away. So this is one thing, this European platform uh, tackling undeclared work, which functions now within the European Labour Authority. Now it's, it's ELA uh, who is in lead. And I would also mention uh, the evaluation, the recent evaluation of the uh, Employer Sanctions Directive uh, carried out by the Commission. Uh, which, which uh, puts uh, a sizable emphasis on measures protecting uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, irregularly uh, staying who are uh, employed in the grey economy. Uh, again, with, with FRA findings reflected in this evaluation, uh, which might lead uh, in future into legislative changes as well. I would leave it here. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, uh, and, and take any remarks. Thanks so much, Thomas. I know your time is tight. Um, I'm going to, because we have 10 minutes left, and I don't want to knock on a delay into the next panel, because they're, they're going to be dealing um, with one of the, the biggest issues around um, irregular uh, irregular migration and undocumented populations, which is regularization. Um, so do stay for that um, panel. I would like to direct us to a big question and then look for um, some answers um, from the existing panel. I'm going to ask my question in two parts. Um, it's been a long time um, since clandestino. Um, and we're all curious, of course, to see what the results of Miram um, might provide. Um, it would be uh, it's a question from, from the floor, um, uh, and I think it would be interesting to hear from each of the panelists um, how they think that things may have changed um, since, um, since some of the past research, um, specifically clandestino. Um, but also, I'm going to put that question first to, to Dieter, and I'm going to add um, an extra uh, level of um, question on top, which is, um, it, that's a hard question to ask. Um, and it would be good to, if you could explain a little bit um, why it's such a hard question to, uh, to answer, because it's you could also maybe explain to, to the attend attendees what are the kind of methodological difficulties um, uh, inherent in taking on a big research task like this? Um, I think to, to the completely uninitiated, um, as I have been in the past, you kind of imagine this to be a headcount exercise. It'd be great if you could um, both say whether you think that the, you expect to see huge differences in, in the big figures and in the kind of range that might emerge from a new research project. Um, but I'd also like to 
leave a little time for Jan um, and to Tamash also to hear from them whether they think there's going to be um, significant differences in terms of some of the more granular data that emerges if, um, from a new research project. But over to you, um, Dieter, for a first, your thoughts. Well, indeed, uh, a difficult question to answer. So I, I, I start with the second question, with the difficulties. And um, so one problem is that all data are biased, which we have on this uh, regard. And this makes data collection extremely difficult and changes the comparability between the states. So for example, intensity of public debates on the the identification requirements, whether you have sort of one identification number like in the Nordic states, which you need for everything or not much of this kind in some other states, this makes a difference. And also the kind of enforcement measures and enforcement pressure and staffing of organizations who who might detect uh, undocumented immigrants. And this is different between the states. And this is also a reason why, from my point of view, not having looked at a number of states now, I wouldn't make an estimate about how it changed about the states. I can only say one thing, maybe. What we have seen in clandestino is that it makes a big difference if you have EU, new EU member states and leaving EU member states. So we had the Brexit in the meantime, um, a big country leaving uh, that uh, hosted a lot of persons without a regular status, um, which will certainly make a difference and not so many new countries joining that might contribute to the number of irregular migrants in the European Union. We have a refugee move movement um, from Ukrainians uh, who usually do not enter irregularly and who do not stay, uh, do not have to stay in irregularity but it's not much known about the, the statuses in between, for example, if people wait to take a decision. So that will have an impact on that. So I think I leave it to that for the moment. Thank you, Dieter. Tamash, I know your time is pressed, so I'm gonna to come to you next. Um, from your position and from your agency's position, are there aspects of the new research that you're eager to see or big changes that you'd expect to see from um, given the time lapse between the, the two research exercises? Thanks for the question. Uh, first, I was still reflecting on the methodological difficulties, but uh, of course, uh, from the institutional perspective, it's, it's highly relevant and more pertinent what you have just asked. Uh, I mean, the, the, the simple answer would be that, of course, the estimates or data or whatever comes out of, of the MIRAM project uh, will, be, will be up to date since I'm in clandestino. Everyone refers to that, but it essentially uh, reflects the situation on the ground as of 2008. The figures released in 2009, and we are still uh, um, using it to, 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 to some extent. Uh, although, um, Bra, uh, the fundamental rights agency has also carried out some large scale service uh, on, on uh, people uh, with immigrant background and also uh, uh, on, 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 on uh, migrants uh, staying, uh, living in the EU, although that was not uh, the main focus of the, of the survey, but we collected some, some data in the past uh, uh, years. My point is that, I mean, the, the new data can also corroborate, uh, triangulate, or even you know, uh, uh, put into perspective what we have found. Uh, since uh, uh, even this large scale uh, survey I'm referring to covered uh, hun, uh, tens of thousands of, 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 of people, uh, but it, it, it uh, was not meant to uh, give a full picture of, of, of this population, of the uh, population in an irregular situation across the EU. 
but uh, it can be used as, as a springboard for, for further estimates. And uh, uh, we definitely uh, uh, are waiting for, for, for more tangible, concrete, and fresh uh, uh, data uh, across the board, uh, which uh, is applicable to EU27 uh, and not, not just uh, in, in some uh, uh, countries. Since, I mean, we are working on irregular migration. We are gonna uh, work in future on that, uh, on that topic. And given the nature of, of, of the, the work we are doing, this evidence-based and data-driven, uh, we can't stop at just analyzing the legal and policy framework, but we need uh, hard uh, data from the ground. It can uh, um, consolidate and, and solidify uh, what we, we find. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's very much needed. And although it will be out in 2025 or, or beyond, but uh, definitely it can be a, a game changer. And also along the lines, Tita uh, um, uh, explained uh, about uh, uh, policy uh, making and how it can, it can frame or reframe the, the narrative, which is, which is very much... Uh, uh, needed in this hidden phenomenon where, of course, uh, political uh, uh, considerations can distort it and can uh, magnify it and can 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 uh, use it because of the of the of the hidden nature of the phenomenon without uh, uh, the the uh, hard facts that can be uh, just put forward. Hey, stop! It's not true what you are saying since we have we have the data and and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, uh, this can be also uh, another important uh, contribution of the of the Miram outputs to to have a more data, fact, and evidence based uh, uh, debate on this such uh, heated and 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 politically distorted domain. I would stop here. Thanks very much, Thomas. Um, I'm going to turn finally to to Jan. Um, Jan, from your perspective, um, I. In Utrecht, and also as part of a coalition of other cities um, that deal with the consequences um, of uh, um, having un undocumented populations um, and very little data, um, are there are there particular things that you'd expect to see that are different um, to uh, the last data gathering exercise going back twelve years? Um, what would you expect to see, given your experience? Now, if, if I look at uh, 12 years ago, uh, for example, on that moment, there was a regularization, a big regularization in the Netherlands started. So many uh, the, uh, former uh, uh, asylum seekers were then uh, regularized in the Netherlands. So that changed a lot uh, about the situation uh, uh, in, in the Netherlands and also about the figures. But we are 13 years later, and we had uh, uh, two big influxes of uh, in 2016, and now with the Ukrainians. And although, uh, for example, on the latter group, uh, uh, um, Ukrainians uh, are still uh, under protection, and there are a lot of third country nationals also who flew from the from the Ukrainian war who are now on the moment uh, can be in an irregular situation, for example, from 4 March of 23, at least in the Netherlands, I'm not sure how it's in other countries. And that can also be, um, in only in our country, it can be a few thousand people, and on the EU level can be a, a lot of people. So, uh, 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 and especially also with the 2016 influx, although most of people from Syria and Eritrea got a residence permit, there are also a lot of people who didn't. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm quite curious about not only the amount, but also um, which nationalities uh, are there, which nationalities uh, are in the undocumented uh, population. Of course, we see some some of them uh, who ask for help uh, or are vulnerable, uh, we see them, but we don't know exactly uh, who the others are. Uh, so I'm, I'm really curious to know more about that. And one thing on the maybe methodological side of things I want to add, uh, don't, don't take the fish 
catch and recatch method is that if there is a, in a, in a, in a, in the second uh, uh, amount of fish uh, there are uh, less people or, or that are in we're also in the first catch um, and we always say oh if there is less people then there will be a bigger amount of uh, people in that uh, 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 in the committed population that was one of the met methods used in the Netherlands and, uh, uh, and and therefore they said oh there are many many undocumented in Utrecht and my only answer was are not more more undocumented in uh, in Utrecht there are smarter undocumented uh, uh, undocumented in uh, in Utrecht because they didn't get apprehended by the alien police for two times. Uh, so it's very, very, very important to take a long uh, discussion about the, met 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 the methods you use uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, Miram project, because otherwise uh, the, the whole thing will, 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 will be a mess in the end. So uh, I'm quite sure uh, everyone is aware of it, but I just stress it for uh, another one. But so for more, if not only numbers, but nationalities, but also if you know more about the population, about the situation uh, of the, this documented population, then we would be very happy. So thank you to Jan, and I'm going to um, just wrap up here uh, because we have another panel coming and I, I want to leave uh, time for them, um, uh, full time for them. Um, there's a question that just came in towards the end of this session, and I think I can deal with it quickly, um, but point to some resources. A question from Zoe Gardner on the Pew research that was referenced um, by uh, our panelists. Um, I think um, as a general rule, researchers into uh, the undocumented population are a very thoughtful and reasonable group of people who talk calmly about the topic. But among their number um, is uh, Frank Duvel, um, uh, an expert on the topic, who responded to that Pew report um, with a series of tweets. I think possibly the only time he ever used Twitter, and most of them were in capital letters, and all of them were extremely rude about the Pew research. Um, so I think that's a reasonable summary of how well it was received. It basically used um, US methodology, traced it, um, applied it very crudely um, to the European situation, came up with big numbers and used those big numbers to get cited everywhere. Um, so I think it's a pretty good example of what not to do. Um, and I'm happy to respond in writing um, to, to Zoe or um, through other some, to some other means um, to point to a couple of more informed responses, but I just wanted to deal with that quickly. Um, so from a bad piece of research to an excellent um, researcher who I've enjoyed speaking to and reading her work um, over many years, um, Anna Trianda Filibu um, is going to host the next panel. Um, and I will leave her to introduce her panelists, but thanks very much for the chance to speak to everybody and see so many familiar faces and um, hear some wisdom. And I'm very pleased that there's going to be new research on its way. It's been a pleasure to join this afternoon and I look forward to hearing the rest of the, the, the second panel, um, but bye from my side. Thank you, bye-bye, all the best. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the segue. And yeah, wonderful to be with all of you um, here today. Actually, uh, on, on one hand, I'm really delighted to have so many so many people on board and that's uh, the virtual is helping to have people. And I've noticed I have, you know, fellow Canadians from Vancouver joining. And I just want to alert everyone that um, the conference started at 9 a.m. my time in Toronto, but it's 6 a.m. in Vancouver. And I've seen people joining actually from from different parts of Europe um, and also Africa. And, and so I'm delighted. Um, in a way, le less delighted that we are here almost 15 years after the clandestino project and we're still speaking about the same issues, um, which means we haven't found ways, um, particularly in policy and in politics, 
to deal with an important issue. And I think the previous panel very well uh, highlighted not, not just the question of data and of reliable data and estimates, but also the question of vulnerability of people and the human rights concerns that are involved um, uh, you know, in, this, in this domain. Uh, um, our second panel is um, focusing actually on the solutions. And this is uh, the second part of the Miram project. And it, it's been um, a question that many of you will remember Alberts and, and other colleagues work on the Regina project again, more than 10 years ago, looking at how we can address um, uh, you know, migrants without status and particularly uh, through regularizations. And um, I think that's, so, so in that sense, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity with the Miram project to, to address both issues that really needed updating. And although many of us and many of you in, um, in the audience have worked on these issues and produced very important work, both from a research and a policy perspective, this um, a project gives us an opportunity to really gather forces and hopefully make an impact on, on the debate. With that, well, maybe I, I'd like to say also I'm joining today, as I said, from Toronto, I've moved to Toronto to take up a Canada Excellence Research Chair uh, in Migration Integration in uh, summer 2019. So of course the pandemic caught up with me, but, uh, uh, but this has given me also new perspectives, both on migration in general and migration governance, but also particular, particularly on irregular migration in a country like Canada that is surrounded by three oceans and the United States. As you can imagine, the situation is much more different than it is for um, most European countries, for countries in the Middle East or in Africa that have really permeable borders and are very well connected, and also that whose land mass is smaller. Uh, Canada is the second largest um, country in the world after Russia, but of course it has comparatively a tiny population of 36 million. And it has a very proactive and highly regulated immigration system. Uh, we are welcoming every year. Uh, actually, the um, last year we welcomed 430,000 new permanent residents. So when we speak about immigrants in Canada, we mean permanent residents. So people who have a secure um, status and are on their way to citizenship. And you can achieve that status on, on, on the moment of entry to the country or after having been a temporary permit holder. Um, and the target for the next three years is half a million per year. So you can you can see how immigration is part of the economic and demographic and social growth of the country, and it's part of the national narrative. At the same time, it's been a year that the prime minister gave, um, how can I say, a directive to the minister of immigration saying, you have to do something about the population with, uh, without status. And this has been in the works for over 10 months. There's currently a very strong civil society campaign, uh, which is called Status for All. And Status for All in Canada means status for those without status, but st status and status meaning permanent residency, but also permanent residency for temporary migrants. Um, so you can see, and I'll be happy to take up this more um, in, in the discussion, but as you can see, the way the, the, the discourse and the policy is, is framed here is quite different from Europe, but I hope we can learn from each other both today and in, in the course of the next uh, three years as we work in the Miram project. I have three distinguished colleagues and um, scholars, but also policy people for this panel. Uh, I have my colleague Alan Desmond, who is at the University of Leicester School of Law, who's going to introduce us to the most recent uh, regularization in Ireland. Um, then I have Eduardo da Fonseca Poa, who is head of International Relations Unit in the High Commission for Migration in the Republic of Portugal. And he's going to speak to us also about the most recent um, regularization in Portugal, which um, took place during the pandemic, and Axel Kreienbrink, who is a coordinator of the Research Center on Migration, Integration, and, uh, and Asylum at the Federal Office for Migration and Asylum in Germany, who is going to speak to us about the Duldung, um, uh, you know, status in Germany and the new regularizations, re regularization and the Opportunities Residence Right Act. So um, the idea is that each of our speakers will spend about five minutes telling us about this regularization program, how and why it was introduced, some, some basic, basic facts, if you want. Uh, and then we're going to engage into a discussion to all, because we want to also question, are regularizations a good way of solving the issue? Should we more think, instead of thinking of temporary measures, like a one-off, 
big blast, which has been often the case in European countries, should we be considering mechanisms? So ongoing uh, you know, policies that can uplift people who lose their status or who enter without status for specific reasons. Um, and of course, the politics of it, because we know such things. And, and that's, for instance, an issue that the Canadian government is currently really acutely aware that this is can backfire while it's a good thing it can backfire. So um, I think, Alan, I'll start with you. Great. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, so I'm just going to try and share my um, PowerPoint slides. Do you can you see them? Yeah. Great. OK, uh, so thanks very much, um, uh, Anna, for the introduction. So I, I'm going to just very briefly talk about um, Ireland's most recent regularization scheme, just in very broad brushstrokes, set out the kind of criteria, uh, the outcome, and then look at what kind of was good and maybe not so good uh, about uh, the scheme. So the scheme was open for six months and closed the end of July this year. Uh, in terms of the eligibility criteria, uh, the main one was a, a four years continuous undocumented residence. Um, this reduced to three years where an applicant had a child under the age of 18 and uh, where family applications were made. The four years residence requirement um, applied for the main applicant, but for other family members who were broadly construed, uh, they only had to have been irregularly present for two years. Beyond the residence requirement, Applicants had to show good conduct, good character, and also had to provide proof of their identity and proof of residence for each year of undocumented residence in the state. And then there were um, not inconsiderable fees also to be paid, 550 euro for individual applications or a family unit application uh, for 700 um, euro. So in terms of the kind of content of the regularization status for those who were successful under the scheme, um, they were given a residence permission for initially for two years, which could be renewable, subject to continuing good character, good conduct uh, for a further three years. Crucially, uh, this residence is reckonable um, for applications for citizenship via naturalization. Uh, and another um, important feature of uh, the status granted to successful applicants uh, was unrestricted access to the labor market, so no need for an employment permit, for example. Um, so the outcome of the scheme, uh, so this is quite uh, raw data that was just provided last week uh, in the Parliament, in the Irish Parliament by the Minister for Justice. Um, I'm, uh, arithmetic isn't my strong suit, so I'm not going to talk too much about the, the figures here, but I think it's clear that um, you know, the vast majority of applications to the scheme uh, were successful. So only 2% resulted in, in negative um, decisions. So in terms of um, kind of evaluation the scheme, I think it contains a, a number of kind of really good practice elements. So it has, it had the, the eligibility criteria were quite inclusionary. Uh, so for example, people who had a, a deportation order, an existing deportation order, were entitled to um, apply. Um, sorry, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 there was no requirement um, for applicants to have a, a, a guarantee of employment after regularization. There was no requirement for any kind of a relationship with an Irish citizen in order to apply. Um, so those are the kind of criteria that have applied in previous regularization, regularization schemes in Ireland and other countries, which had the effect of really narrowing the number of people who could apply. Um, this 2022 scheme, by contrast, was quite broad in scope, uh, quite inclusionary in terms of its eligibility criteria. It was open for six months, which again is a wider, a, a broader window um, for submission than a lot of other regularization schemes in other countries in the past, and it was relatively widely publicized. It was the, the it was quite applicant friendly in terms of the wide range of documentation that was accepted as proof of identification and proof of residence um, in Ireland. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the residence of, of people um, successfully granted status under the scheme uh, is reckonable um, uh, for citizenship applications, um, which again uh, is quite progressive and, and is something that you don't see in many regularization schemes that have been carried out in the past in 
in, in Ireland and in Europe. And again, I, I mentioned already the unrestricted access to the labour market that was um, granted to successful applicants. In terms of, of kind of critique uh, of the scheme, um, there was a requirement of continuous undocumented residents, um, which excluded people who, for example, may have been present in Ireland for four years lawfully, but then may have fallen into irregular status and may have been irregularly present for six months, a year, two years, whatever. But those people, despite long-term residence in Ireland, uh, were excluded uh, from the scheme. And it's, it's difficult to see a justification for that exclusion. Um, similarly, the fees were relatively high. Um, individual applications, 550 euro. Family unit applications, 700 euro. Successful applicants subsequently would then have to pay a registration fee of 300 euro. And uh, so this posed quite a challenge to a lot of uh, applicants um, and uh, civil society played a crucial role in providing financial support to applicants who weren't able to cover the costs of the application fees themselves, uh, particularly Migrant Rights Centre of Ireland based in Dublin and NASC, uh, an NGO in Cork. Uh, they both uh, supported uh, applicants who were facing them. Um, Financial challenges. Um, so um, I'll, I'll leave it there. And maybe uh, if there's questions, we can go into more detail on, on some of the other uh, some issues. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Um, and um, yeah, indeed, indeed, it seems like a well thought scheme, and it's good to have very up to date data. Um, Eduardo. Thank you, Anna. Um, let me start by thanking the invitation and opportunity to speak at today's conference. Um, as residents in a foreign country, migrants often find themselves in a position of vulnerability, particularly newcomers, and aggravated when the migrant status is not regulated or documented. Recent crises like the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted how specially fragile and exposed migrants can be and urged the international community to reflect even more on how to best meet migrants' needs and guarantee access to rights. It is within this scope that uh, I will share with you the Portuguese case and how we acted during the pandemic with the aim of protecting migrants' rights, while at the same time trying to minimize as we could the impact um, of COVID-19 had on these communities. Allow me to highlight that uh, what we did in Portugal was not a regularization on formal juridic terms. In fact, our efforts converged on guaranteeing and extending access to healthcare, social and other rights, irrespectively of migratory status, documented or undoc undocumented. This approach allowed us to comply with our basic rights independently of the legal framework in which particularly migrants fit in. And that was our priority. So let me tell you about some of the measures Portugal adopted to ensure proper protection to all migrants. For a start, migrants and asylum seekers with pending applications for residence permits within the Immigration and Border Service were considered in a regular situation. This meant equal access to rights, services, and support as documented foreign residents in dimensions such as health, social security, employment, and housing. In total, this translated in access to rights and support to more than 356,000 immigrants with ongoing regularization processes in 2020. Added to this, other adopted measures were the extension of validity of existing resident permits until the 21st of December 2021 to prevent expiration and consequent loss of rights. Also, a simplified procedure was implemented for granting and renewal of residence permits. Immediate allocation of a social security number regardless of the migrant status, was also made possible. In a nutshell, these first measures allowed all migrants to circumvent 
what could otherwise be bureaucratic obstacles, allowing not only access to the National Health Service under equal conditions, which during the pandemic was probably the most urgent need, but also to other public services, healthcare rights and social benefits. It even enabled migrants to, to sign lease contracts, draft employment contracts, open bank accounts, and contract essential public services. We should also mention the exemption from users, user fees in cases of diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19. Portugal also considered its support services for migrant integration as essential public services, which meant that even during the different lockdowns, they remained in operation with face-to-face -face assistance. This way, it was guaranteed that access to tailored support was still an available option. Migrants were nonetheless strongly encouraged to use alternative channels that were strengthened during the pandemic and prior booking was required for appointments. Other dimension to which Portugal dedicated special attention was communication. Coming with and implementing the necessary policies to ensure access to rights and specialized support is one thing, but to reach out to migrant communities and make them aware of those solutions is another, especially taking into account some language barriers. Disseminating official and reliable information and making that information easily accessible was then another of our concerns. Public bodies, such as the High Commission for Migration, worked closely with civil society organizations in this matter, creating and translating information material. Additionally, the High Commission for Migration also had a permanent team of translators dedicated to work on the ground and supporting other governmental areas, such as health services. We also carried out, in partnership with organizations responsible for the reception of asylum seekers and refugees, the Ministry of Health and Medical Students Associations, in-person awareness campaigns aiming at orientations regarding the context at the time of COVID-19, where topics like different differences between the type of masks available, how to contact with health services, or how to stay in isolation, among others, were addressed. As a final point, a third mention I would like to refer, given its importance and one, one which Portugal also dedicated special attention, was the prevention and the addressing of discrimination. It is true that we all had to learn on how to deal with the pandemic and its consequences. Uh, it is also true that no matter how unsteady things were, fighting prejudice and discrimination was, is, and will be our uh, priority, no matter the circumstances. In this sense, the public body responsible for this matter, the Commission for Equality and Against Racial Discrimination, kept all its services available during the state of emergency caused by the pandemic, including the reception of complaint, complaints, its processing and technical analysis. It also reinforced the online presence, continued to provide relevant information to victims of discrimination and promoting communication campaigns through its social media channels. Having shared with you all these measures and hoping that my intervention was not too long or detailed, I would like to conclude by underlining that uh, the success of Portugal's approach and all these developments were only made possible by, on one hand, implementing direct, targeted and transversal measures, and on the other hand, recognizing the importance of cooperation and close articulation between not only different public policies um, and bodies, either national and local level, uh, but also local and civil society organizations, entities, including migrant associations and migrant representatives.
In fact, our approach reflected well uh, what is our approach in general when it comes to migrant issues, a comprehensive whole of government, but especially whole of society approach where migrant integration is a transversal issue and a priority to Portugal. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo, yes, and for quickly illustrating the dynamics in Portugal, which are, I think, um, still different from uh, Ireland as it was very much related to, to the pandemic. Um, and I'd like to give the floor now to Axel. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk about a brand new piece of regulation, uh, an act that was passed only last Friday in the German Bundestag, and it covers uh, the regularization of so-called tolerated persons, so persons in Germany who have not, uh, who were rejected asylum seekers or are rejected asylum seekers and but cannot be removed and have a notification of non-removal, the so-called duldung, the toleration. But uh, it's important to know that uh, the toleration status is not a residence status. So this is the background. In principle, Germany is not very famous uh, for regularizations in the past. But uh, and uh, this principle uh, or thinking that people can be or should be regularized on a regular basis, uh, like in former years happened in southern European countries, is uh, politically quite contested in Germany. Nevertheless, it is true that regularization opportunities exist, though in reality they are not called like this. And these uh, opportunities were repeatedly expanded in earlier years and are intensively used. In 2021 alone, about 20,000 people benefited from such measures. The most important but hardly noticed regularization path dates back already to 2005, and already then had the goal of preventing chain tolerations, the so-called Kettenduldungen in Germany. It's the regulation on so-called residents on humanitarian reasons with a special section for persons with toleration for more than 18 months. Also important in the, in the whole array of possible paths uh, of uh, regularizations are the regulation on granting residence for well-integrated young people and adults with a toleration, and uh, another regulation gra for granting residence in cases of sustainable integration. So this is for tolerated people who have already some integration. In addition, there's also a regulation for a genuine track change for tolerated professionals called residence permit for qualified tolerated people on the ground of employment and so on and so on. There are some more possibilities. This saying this, this means that this new so-called Opportunities Residence Right Act, Chancenaufenthaltsgesetz, that has been uh, issue, uh, passed last Friday, expands the previous rights to get a right of stay, but it does not call it regularization, as I said in the beginning. This new act states that anyone who has been on a status of permission, this is the status during the asylum procedure, or the status of toleration, or has resided in Germany with any residence permit within the last five years, as of 31st of October of 22, should be able to acquire this opportunities residence right for 18 months. In this time span, he or she can fulfill the other requirements for a right to stay according to the also amended regulations uh, under sections 25A and 25B of the Residence Act. In particular, securing a livelihood, knowledge of German language, and proof of identity. Criminals remain excluded, as do persons who continue to prevent their removal due to repeated deliberate false statements or active deception of identity. In addition, persons must profess their belief in what we call the free democratic basic order. If the requirements for the issuance of a residence permit according to the aforementioned sections are not met, and this is important, the persons concerned revert to the status 
of toleration. So if they don't fulfill the requirements during 18 months, they fall back in the status of toleration. The legislator wanted with this law a one-time special regulation that prevents others affected from growing time by time into residence title by merely waiting. Calculations in the draft law assume that from approximately 250,000 tolerated persons at the beginning of 2022, more or less than 136,000 will have met the five year stay in Germany deadline as of uh, 31st uh, December of 21. Nevertheless, the government assumes that only roughly 100,000 persons will apply to this new status and that only one third of them will receive the long-term right of residence after this 18 month. This has some consequences as the persons who have been tolerated can get a status and have the risk to fall back in the toleration. As a colleague has pointed out in his statement uh, to the Bundestag, for those who do not receive the long-term right of residence after the 18th month, they will have a roller coaster right in terms of social and residence law as they will start on, on, let's say, social law from the Asylum Seekers Benefit Act to the benefits according to the social code, and then will fall back to the Asylum Seekers Benefits Act. And the same from the toleration status to residence permit and back to toleration status. So far, this regulation, much less discussed in public, however, are the amendments in the aforementioned sections 25A and 25B of the Residence Act, which do not depend on a cutoff date and will also apply in the future. This means that for well-integrated adolescents and young adults, the age limit is raised from 21 to 27 years, and at the same time, the waiting period for application for a residence permit out of a toleration status is reduced from four years to three years. And for access to residence based on sustainable integration, the waiting periods are reduced from six and eight years respectively to four and six years. In practice, this will mean in a number of cases, especially for young persons, and we have to bear in mind that most of the asylum seekers are relatively young, the regularization possibilities will be available shortly after the time when an enforceable obligation to leave the country, so I'm only talking of rejected asylum seekers, arises for the first time. This is, uh, can be um, uh, explained by the reason that the average length of proceeding after the asylum seekers have been rejected, the proceedings before the administrative courts until the obligation to leave the uh, country becomes finally enforceable, takes moral, well, it depends on the cases, but can take up to three years, the whole time span, because our administrative course, uh, courts are um, overwhelmed with cases from the period of 2015 and 16 still. So this would mean that persons who after the whole uh, proceedings will get the toleration and especially young people will have immediate access to the regularization possibilities under section 25A. And second point, in addition, another uh, change of the recent law is that the persons concerned benefit now from the fact that the new law abolishes the restriction of access to integration and language courses according to the so-called likelihood of remaining, the Bleibewahrscheinlichkeit. And so now virtually everyone is allowed to attend a language course as soon as possible after arriving in Germany. However, persons from so-called safe countries of origin only have the opportunity to attend within the limits of available places, so they have no entitlement. But nevertheless, this will increase the proportion of tolerated persons who fulfill at least some of the integration requirements, especially the ability to talk German, 
for right to stay. How this in the long time, uh, no, how, how the outcomes in the long time will be, this remains to be seen. Um, and it also remains to be seen how um, it will be during the next year. Because uh, what I have said for the administrative courts is also valid for the local foreign offices. They are overwhelmed currently, especially due to the uh, many cases of, uh, of Ukraine. So it will be quite difficult for many um, foreigners um, to apply under these new regulations. I think I leave it here for the moment. Much juridical input, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, if I can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Axel. Okay, I want to I want to say something. I've uh, my German is very limited, but I've studied it more than eight months. So I wonder whether eighteen months is a good <laughs> uh, period of time to learn good German. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, I thank you all. Actually, it is it is fascinating to see how different countries have um, addressed the issue of people without status. And I think the positive note is, and and I think partly to the to the questions in the chat is, I think what we clearly see is um, in 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 Germany, in Ireland, in Portugal, the governments were aware, became aware that there is a population that is without status and that needs to be uh, uplifted and protected and given a chance to transfer to status. Um, I would like um, also, however, to point out to um, something that I see as, as um, a bit of a, of a question mark. And of course, that, that, that is also informed by my um, discussions in Canada uh, right now. So I think all these programs sound very temporary to me. So I wonder what is the likelihood that after two years, a significant number of the people who were uplifted into legal status will fall back into irregularity. Um, and this has been, of course, the discussion in Canada. Now, of course, the thing with Canada is, and I remember when uh, first time other colleagues and policymakers started discussing this with me, I was saying, yeah, obviously in a regularization, you first acquire temporary status, not permanent. How would it be that, you know, from no status, you go to permanent? permanent status. Just think permanent residency in Canada is like being an EU citizen in another EU country. You have all the rights except voting. So, um, and uh, people said yes, but the problem is because in Canada, the system is a point system, it's a human capital system. So you have to be highly skilled, speak one of the two official languages and blah, blah. These people, if they're if they're given a temporary status of two years and then they're told to go through the point system, they're not going to go through the point system. We know many of them will fall back into regular status and will will either have to leave the country or, for the good reasons for which they're staying in the country right now, they will just stay. So we need to be bold and and go for long term status. Now, the the distinction between temporary and permanent status in different European countries is not the same as in Canada, it's rather permanent, like actually uh, the right to abode, um, which exists in most countries or like a 10 or indefinite um, uh, duration permit um, is, is kind of a cumulative status in Europe. So you, you have a two year permit, you renew for another two years, um, you, maybe you renew for another two, depending on the different countries regulations, and then you get to long-term status. And usually that status also is a prerequisite for applying for citizenship. But I, it strikes me that while these measures that you um, three presented are, are generous and to a large extent, they try to um, think of several, not all, but several cases of people, um, they are very, um, how can I say, contingent in, in a way. That, so this is my feeling and I'd like to have your thoughts on that. Um, and also, I'd like to take um, actually two of, uh, th there's a couple of questions in the chat that ask the same question. Can you tell, which was also the question that we wanted to discuss, which is, can you tell us what are you, you think, what was the, exactly the context, political context, why um, these three countries that we're talking about, and um, Lorenzo Piccolo from the chat was also pointing out um, to the Italian regularization, that we know attracted over 200,000 applicants, but to this day, actually, the, the 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 number of people that have been approved is really small. It's about 10%. Um, so what what made the government, were the governments feeling that the population was supportive? Were the governments um, just plowing ahead saying, you know, we need to address this? 
Was it the momentum of a particular government? Um, was it something that was in, in the making for like, say, 10 years and then uh, the moment came? So maybe I can ask in the invert order. So ask first Axel um, to, to respond, then Edward, and then Alan. Yes, thank you. I think in the, in the, in the German case, it has, no, the, the important thing in the German case is that we have a relatively new government, a new government of a social democratic green liberal government that came into office one year ago. And it's called in its coalition treaty, this was a question within a broader migration package that was addressed. And this was addressed based on a discussion in Germany that went on for several years, but it was not possible to do with, with the former conservative governments we had. Although this government was conservative social democratic until last year, they were not uh, willing to do this. And I think this was the political momentum to put this measure into action. But at the same time, we still have in the political arena a discussion or let's say a tension between um, the position of migration control and enforcement of the right of asylum. So which worth has the right of asylum if everyone can stay, even if he or she is rejected. But on the other hand, um, the discourse on integration needs for all these people who cannot be removed on an ongoing basis. And although, as, as I told in the beginning, uh, what I said that we still, that we already have regulations that shall um, avoid so-called chain tolerations, nevertheless, it happened. And we, we have a, had an ever bigger group of persons, non-removable persons. And I think this was the, the political possibility now with the new government to come forward with an additional way of regularization. And as I said in my uh, introdu introducing remarks, we have these measures in the law and um, not only uh, one time uh, regularization measures, but they are working on the whole time. And um, as, as I told you, in, 20, in 2021, more than 20,000 persons fall under these regulations. But they are not really discussed under the headline of regularization. I think I leave it at, at the moment due to the time. Yeah, thank you. This is, a, this is a very important and very interesting. I also want to remind people because I'm, I'm I have these fixations with numbers. You have to think uh, Germany has over 80 million of um, you know resident population, so we have to think what 20,000 or 200,000 means. And also considering, for instance, that uh, Portugal has 10 million in Ireland. Alan, collect me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about six million. So I, I think this is important because when we speak about 20,000, I'm thinking 20,000 is a small town, is a lot of people. But we have to think also of, of the size of the country and its population. Eduardo. Yes. Um, well, I think the, the main message, uh, uh, probably important to, to give here, is that um, on general terms, uh, migration in Portugal is not a topic uh, for the political discussion. And until now, I think we are lucky enough to have this either political and also society uh, consensus uh, in terms of the, the migration issues. Of course, th there are some questions in terms of discrimination, all of that, uh, we have to be <laughs> also transparent with that. But on general terms, it's not something which is discussed at, at the political level, irrespectively of the political parties, it is not a topic. I, I can give uh, just an example. Recently uh, at the parliament, uh, we have a, a populist uh, party. Uh, of course, they, they use some, some questions to, to for to, to, to raise awareness <laughs> in terms of, of uh, what they are fighting for. But until now, they, they never uh, addressed the, the migration question. And this is um, very, um, for very concrete reasons. In Portugal, we need workforce at the different levels. 
either at the agriculture level, at the industry, high skilled workers. Um, for instance, at the High Commission for Migration, we deal a lot, I didn't mention during my intervention, but we work also a lot, not only with civil society and NGOs and migrant associations, but of course with the municipalities and the, the local level. In Portugal, we don't have the regional level, we only have the, the central and then, then the local level. And of course, we work in very close cooperation with the municipalities. And from time to time, we receive mayors or we go there <laughs> to, to the ground um, also quite often. Uh, and during the discussions, they say, we need persons here. We need persons to, to work in our territories. So we feel that on if, if it is not for the human rights issue, uh, uh, for the economic purpose, it is very clear that uh, we need migrants in our country. But also in terms of the demographic situation, um, Portugal um, uh, has a very small uh, birth rate uh, and the migrant women, they contribute a lot for, for the, the, the newborns. In fact, I, I can give you just, uh, uh, sometimes we, we give this example just to present how the immigration is important to us. Uh, working with, um, with us at the High Commission, we have an observatory for migration and the colleagues, they, they compile the official statistics uh, from the different ministries. Uh, and the, the net contribution at the social security that we have from the migrants, um, even after they receive the social benefits that of course they are entitled to, it's really, really positive for our, for our balance. So all of those topics contribute a lot to, to this political consensus. It's not from that we are good persons, it's from concrete uh, perspective. Um, and uh, uh, going uh, concretely to, to your question, uh, the regularization process, um, even if we were under a lockdown and with all the pandemic situation, it, it was not uh, a question within the society. We yeah. have, of course, we had, of course, other, other questions, but this, it was not definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo. Yeah, this is uh, this is also very, very interesting, and I think a different situation compared to Germany. But let's hear from Alan. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, as to why now for regularization, uh, I think one of the kind of key factors is long-standing advocacy efforts by um, civil society in Ireland. Um, especially Migrant Rights Centre Ireland, a Dublin-based NGO. They've been calling for regularization for over 20 years now, since 2001, I think. <clears throat> and um, in the campaign for regularization that's been going on for many years, uh, undocumented migrants themselves have been quite visible. Their voice has been audible. Um, the Migrant Rights Centre Ireland organises um, about 3,000 undocumented uh, people uh, in a kind of a group called Justice for the Undocumented, who are, as I say, quite visible and vocal in the call for regularization. And so this has um, contributed to kind of increasing calls across different kind of actors and sectors of society over the last 10 to 15 years, increasing calls for regularization. So, you know, we've seen city councils, local authorities um, endorse regularization. Um, um, individual members of parliament, uh, the Parliamentary Justice Committee, uh, UN treaty bodies like the Committee on the Rights of the Child, they've all uh, kind of added their voice um, to, to, to the regularization campaign. And, and I think also an important factor was, was the pandemic. So, you know, during the pandemic, the situation of undocumented migrants, it emerged into the public debate. Um, you know, the media was reporting on, on the fears of undocumented migrants of being detected if they used public services like healthcare. And these media reports also highlighted how undocumented workers were, you know, performing uh, essential duties and essential caring duties during the pandemic. So all of this culminated back in um, June 2020 in when the new government, when the current government was, was 
coming into government it issued a you know a program for government and it included in the program for government a commitment to undertake um regularization uh, and so that's what we've we, what we've seen this year the kind of implementation of that um um commitment uh, to undertake regularization so i think those th those are kind of the reasons why we're having such a a relatively applicant friendly regularization scheme in, in 2022 in Ireland and um, just to go back to your question Anna about these being quite kind of contingent and not necessarily um, having a long term impact I think the Irish program you know because it puts its um, successful applicants on the road to citizenship um, I think it's a long term solution for people who are successfully regularized this year obviously people who didn't, uh, you know, people who subsequently become undocumented and this year and later aren't going to be able to benefit from the, the regularization scheme that is now closed. But the successful applicants are uh, on the route on on a pathway to citizenship. Uh, and that was explicitly stated in press releases by the Minister for Justice announcing the scheme. And um, so it's um, I think it's, you know, it's a it's a really, from that perspective, a really progressive regularization measure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan and, and all of you. So, and I'm not in um, a comment in the chat from Dita that I'm not sure if it, it's a little pessimistic a comment or or optimistic Dita because Dita was writing, you know, if we look at the um, a little bit of a longer term perspective, we see uh, populations without status building up, and then the pressure comes to a point where governments create some sort of regularization, um, and then the whole game starts again. Um, but I think the answers we received also a little bit um, uh, disagree with with your statement, Dita, because actually I think Alan showed how this was a pressure that was building up um, through the years in Ireland, um, and that civil society, if I understand, the, and the broader coalition of um, actors, which would actually give. Um, um, you know, a lot of material to colleagues who work on multi-level governance so, or on what Maurizio Ambrosini calls the battleground uh, of migration asylum policy. So we see a broader coalition of actors coming together and, uh, you know, pushing forward for a solution. While um, I think we have a different narrative from Portugal um, that kind of resembles that of Canada. And I was writing in the chat that maybe, yeah, we can consider also that Portugal has, well, two seas and, and Spain in its borders. So it's not in the same geographical position for sure as Germany or Italy or Poland uh, for that matter, or my own country of origin, Greece. So there is, a, I understand uh, both a realization and awareness and, and, and nar actually I understand that in, in Portugal, it's not a very strong narrative in the way it is in Canada is this is where who we are and where we're going kind of thing, but it is an understanding and awareness of the population that this is uh, good for the country. And if for some reason our policy, our regulation policy didn't allow for people to retain their status or to come in legally, we should provide for ways to, to integrate. While I think um, the, the situation um, in Germany resembles more what Dita said, where you know pressure has been building up, there has been an effort to avoid kind of gray situations on uh, not unclear and temporary. And, and, and there is a sense that at some point it's good, it, it's important for the people in terms, if you want, of their basic human rights, but it's also important for the country not to have people who have no access to any um, support measures that this is not uh, leading to anywhere. Um, I think uh, I, I would like to, um, I mean, we still have five minutes. I would like to, to have a quick reaction uh, from you in terms of, um, you know, what would you think of a more permanent um, mechanism for regularization? We know some countries have had this. Um, I think France in the past, I know Greece had it. I'm not sure if it still exists. So if people could prove that for 10 years they've been living in the country, whether completely without documents or with some periods of legal status, some periods of irregular status, there was kind of a humanitarian acknowledgement that if you have ties to this country or you've been through significant hardship in surviving without documents, and this is kind of an ongoing mechanism that um, you can apply to. But I also want to point out 
to um, uh, an innovative practice uh, that Italian courts adopted in the period 2018-2019, and on which I'm not sure if uh, they are in, in, uh, in the audience, Katie Kushminder and Caterina Guidi and myself have been writing a paper, hopefully it will get published soon, where we looked at um, a particular practice I'll illustrate in just two minutes. So it, there were a lot of people going through Libya, coming to Italy in, in the years after 2015, but also throughout, um, applying for asylum and being rejected because they could not prove sufficiently individually that they were being persecuted in their countries of origin. Um, of course, the asylum process lasted a certain period. Um, during this time, these people had access to um, support measures as asylum seekers. Uh, through the then called SPRAR system of Italy. Um, and then with the help of Sam and Joe, they would appeal the, the refusal and they would apply for humanitarian status, which is in Italy a status that is different from Duldung. So it's a status that is given to people. Um, so to women who are pregnant or who have um, a newborn that is under six months old, people who are critically ill, um, people who um, are minors, um, and also people who have been through extreme hardship. And that's where um, the law and also then um, a cassation court decision um, opened a door because it specified if the person when appealing and going to the court, say a year later, could show that they're being integrating in Italian society. And integrating so Italian society could be proven through having some, a job, taking a speaking Italian, having friends and, and networks in Italy, all kinds of such evidence, the law then, um, you know, the judges actually would uh, rule in favor and give people humanitarian status. And actually what we are arguing in our paper is that this is a kind of status that should be emulated by other countries because it really provides a mechanism for people who fall through the cracks. And where I'm, I, I don't wanna delay you with, with um, very much for our reasoning, but I would like to, to ask very quickly our three panelists to have a reaction about what they think about a more of an ongoing regularization mechanism. So for instance, Axel, what if, is, is this what this act that has been discussed in the German parliament, I understand, is trying to create? And, and what about, um, for instance, um, Ireland and, and Portugal? Well, as I said, uh... In the public discussion is this 18 month span, this new regularization mechanism. But as I also told you that we have these regular uh, regulations for granting residence for well integrated young people and adults and also the granting of residence in the cases of sustainable integration, which are in the law in near to the article of humanitarian admission. So in my view, and the longer I read it and the longer I study it, I see it resembles to what you have told for the Italian case, and it, it resembles what I have studied on uh, the, uh, the arraigo social and the arraigo laboral, so the rootedness on social means or on, on, on labor market means in, in, in the Spanish law. So it resembles, and as the entry uh, th thresholds for these regulations have been lowered, plus the possibility that everyone who comes into this country can now access um, language courses. So all this together creates a permanent regularization mechanism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see. And without doing a big bang kind of measure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Eduardo? Uh, well, I, I represent here the, the Portuguese institution, which is in charge of the promotion of the integration of migrants and refugees. So we are always advocating for the importance of the regularization of the, the, of the persons that are coming to our country. Um, besides that, um, I, 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 I didn't mention, I mean, probably some of you are aware of that, uh, we provide services to all kinds of migrants, irrespectively of the status. And in fact, in Portugal, also irrespectively of the status, a migrant can work, can sign a work contract, can do the discounts to social security and pay their taxes. And in fact, this is also important to have the work contract 
and all the discounts to social security to, to do the regularization. And so the, this is a, a, a common situation. Um, of course, we respect the, and we have to, to respect the, the instructions from the home affairs, um, but we are always advocating for that. And part of the, the work that we do uh, on our, at our one-stop shops and all of that is also to provide direct support from, to, to migrants for them to, to apply for their regularization. So despite of the, and to conclude, despite of the, the, the process, either an, either an extraordinary one on a, on, or, or a regular one, uh, we think it is important, of course, to, to have migrants on a regular situation for, for their own protection and also for, for everybody's sake. Yeah, thank you, Eduardo. And I, I see in the chat the comments about Spain. Yeah, true, Spain has the um, RI mechanism, as Axel also said. Uh, my understanding is, of course, but I think this will be for another workshop or a conference of the Miran project. My understanding is the RI was started very generously, um, but has been kind of not becoming a, a little bit um, a dog that... Um, chases its, its tail when you try to satisfy the conditions, but certainly it's a very positive mechanism. Alan. Yeah, I, am, I, I don't see it happening in Ireland. I, I mean, in a sense, we, there is a, if you like, a permanent regularization um, avenue in that anyone who is issued with a deportation order um, has the opportunity to submit reasons as to why the deportation order should be revoked and why they should be allowed to remain. Um, so you could view that as a, a you know a, a regularization option, but it's it's kind of a risky one for for um for, for migrants. Uh, but you know I I don't see Ireland putting in place um a scheme such as what we've just had uh, on a kind of a permanent footing. Um, if if you look back over the um kind of parliamentary debates and questions over the last ten to fifteen years. Uh, the, the response to questions about regularization, the stock response is um, any undocumented migrant uh, is encouraged to contact the Department of Justice um, explaining why they should be regularized and their case will be considered on a, on a kind of case by case basis on its merits. Um, but be, beyond that, I, you know, I, I don't see um, a kind of a more systematic uh, applicant friendly um, scheme being put in place on a permanent basis. Yeah, thank you. On, and on, on that, actually, I also want to, to add, and I'm um, happy to see also my colleague Shiva Mohan is in, in the chat, that we, one thing that we are working on in Miriam, and we're working also on a Canadian project about sanctuary cities is, for instance, firewalls. What happens to people when they um, sub, uh, submit an application, and if this application is not successful, um, they, they, they're likely to be afraid to, you know, to be then to have uh, the police knocking at their doors, you know, you're on a flight tomorrow. Um, so, but stay tuned with the Miram project. I'd like to give the floor now to Albert for our concluding remarks. And so happy to see you all. And I know Michelle is trying to find a solution to share an editable version of, of the chat. So as to share contacts and information that was shared without breaching anyone's privacy. Albert. Yeah. Thank you very much for having the floor again. Um, yeah, and thanks to everyone uh, for attending. Um, Apart from the chat, we are also making the video available on Becom's YouTube channel, and uh, it will also be posted on on the Miram website um, once it's uh, it's it's been built up. What I, what I saw in this discussion, I think, were uh, 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 several things. One is a, a general theme, also of uh, visibility, invisibility. Uh, I think. Um, uh, was it Anna that, that um, mentioned the word the Big Bang of having a one-off regularization? And sometimes it's it's uh, it's uh, if you're talking about policies, um, it's it's more opportune and better to do things a little bit in the back door, um, in a back door setting. Uh, so keeping things invisible. But this, of course, is also about the populations that we are talking about. It, uh, uh, it might, for for some purposes, it's useful and necessary to to shed uh, the light on 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 certain populations to know who we are. Um, 
but there are also sometimes very good reasons not to do so. And um, so, for example, for organizations not to talk about who their clients are in, in specifically uh, related to all sorts of, 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 uh, of issues. So, um, and this, I think, links to, to, to other issues that uh, especially came up in, in the second uh, panel. Uh, there are dilemmas um, that might be unresolvable and we just can highlight that there that there are these dilemmas um, for example between the uh, the, uh, the dilemma that Axel mentioned uh, of of uh, yeah uh, dealing somehow with a long-term presence of for instance with a very limited with a non-status like like Duldo. Uh, on the one hand, and 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 uh, and, and having an um, um, yeah operating in an asylum system that is uh, accepted by uh, by uh, in the political sphere and by uh, the uh, majority. Um, uh, on the other hand, so there are dilemmas and, and that that might not be uh, resolvable, um, but it's useful to to to, to highlight these. Um, and in terms, and, and the same uh, dilemmas also uh, relates to the data. Um, the uh, data has, has, I think, made it very cl clear how difficult it is uh, to um, talk about, well, to identify uh, yeah, uh, valid uh, quantitative indicators of, of um, migrant, regular migrant uh, population, especially also if you look at it, that this is not a uh, a stable uh, kind of uh, field. Uh, it's uh, situations can can change very quickly. Uh, for example, with with, uh, with uh, Brexit, uh, that affected uh, a lot of people uh, in terms of uh, legal status, at least for a certain time, when it was not clear what how their uh, situation would be resolved. Um, uh, the uh, in regard to the temporary protection directive, there are the situation of, of Ukrainians who is who have um, uh, entered European countries before the outbreak of the war, who are not meant by the directive, but may 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 have recursed it. So there are all these 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 um, uh, these issues and and also difficulties in in, in putting up numbers uh, to it that uh, in, in situations that change very rapidly and also on the individual kind of level, individual persons may, uh, and that has been mentioned also before, may have a, a legal status, be admitted as a student uh, and then uh, lose their residence permit, perhaps because they miss a deadline. Um, and then uh, get uh, get uh, a residence permit uh, uh, after some maybe also some legal legal proceedings um, uh, to to re return them to um, to to a, to a legal status. So that, that's a, a very dynamic situation. Um, but what we also will do in the project is not just trying to to come up with um, a lot of different numbers and estimates, but we actually also want to, to provide toolkits, um, methods, what can be done to study, um, to estimate a certain um, population, um, the number of, of undocumented migrants in general or the persons who have uh, received their um, um, deportation order uh, and so on. Um, and um, we will um, develop, well, a test a, a, a number of, of uh, methods that might in the future also be taken up by um, other agencies uh, to more regularly estimate um, uh, yeah, migration, migration, uh, the, the, the number of uh, irregular, uh, irregular migrants. Um, and that's in the end uh, should result in, in, in a handbook on irregular migration data um, where we will also come up with, with uh, caveats and other recommendations of the kind that, 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 that Tito spoke of. In parallel and in, in reflecting this handbook, uh, focusing more on the quantitative, uh, quantitative side of things, we will also um, uh, elaborate um, handbook on pathways out of of, of uh, irregularity and specifically focusing on 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 
people who have not returned on the regularization, um, which will not only provide uh, some normative uh, guidance, but also uh, will compile some of the evidence that we are looking at uh, in terms of what impact um, regularization have had on, on both the individuals concerned, what impact did, that, did it have in terms of uh, migration dynamics, all, all, uh, all of these questions that have been raised in the, in the political debate. Um, but with this, I, I, I want to close um, um, and thank everyone uh, for attending.